always do what's best for the patient. This kind of seems com- it seems like everyone would know this, but you would be surprised, uh, especially as a nurse anesthesia resident, when you're in the OR, hopefully your CRNAs are with you when you're extubating. And it can be easy for the staff to kind of rush you along and try to push you to do things that may not be in the best interest of the patient. Maybe you need to stay there an extra five or 10 minutes to do whatever you're doing, make sure the patient's stable enough to be transported to pack you. Whatever that is, don't let the time or don't let the pressure for production get in the way of doing what's best for the patient. And sometimes that's hard to do with pushy people in the OR, but just remember that you have a duty to that patient and the duty is to do no harm. future CRNA. Welcome to CRNA School Prep Academy podcast. I have a very special episode lined up for you today, and it is part of our guest host series where I am bringing current SRNAs on the show for you as a guest host on the CSBA podcast. And my thought process behind doing this is I wanted you to hear from current students, a variety of current students who are at different stages of their CRNA journey and really allow you to kind of step into their world and hear them talk about what it's like to be a current student dealing with things like difficult preceptors or um, different uh, anesthesia topics, clinical topics, maybe even things like time management, stress management, things like that. I think this is going to be, these episodes are going to be gold and I hope you enjoy as much as I always do hearing from current students. I know for a fact that the reason why Serenity School Prep Academy is where it is today and the reason why I have learned so much is from diving all in, listening to current students along with CRNAs, share a wealth of information and really kind of taking all of that information and kind of compiling it into kind of the system that we have created today. And I know that you're doing the same thing by tuning into the show week after week, developing your own method, your own strategy, your own system for success. So I hope you enjoy these guest episodes. Let's go ahead and get into today's show. What's up, everyone? I'm David Warren, and welcome back to this episode on the CRNA School Prep Academy podcast. I'll be your guest host today. And today we're continuing part two of our three-part discussion on emergence and extubation. If you didn't listen to part one, go back and have a listen to that episode first. We really discuss some basic principles of emergence and extubation, and then take a deep dive into doing deep extubations and kind of what that looks like. So if you haven't listened to that episode, go check that out first. This episode will probably make a little bit more sense. We're just going to continue kind of right where we left off with talking about emergence and extubation. And today we're going to talk about doing awake extubations. As you recall in our part one episode, we really took a deep dive into doing deep extubations. And I told you there's really a few different ways that you can wake people up, but there's two big, broad 30,000 foot view main ways. And that is doing a deep extubation where the patient is under a full MAC of gas, they're still under general anesthesia, and we pull the tube deep and kind of let them wake up slowly. And that's really good for patients who that is appropriate for. And we kind of defined what that was. We're not really going to go down that rabbit hole again, but that's what we talked about in the last episode. And today we're really going to take a deep dive into doing awake extubations. And that really sounds like just what it is doing an awake extubation. And this is honestly probably what you're used to in the ICU, waking people up and and extubating them when they're able to breathe on their own and not doing it when they're still under Uh, which you're not under general anesthesia in the ICU anyway, but in the ICU, people are awake when they're extubated is kind of what I'm getting at, obviously, unless they're terminal. Um, So we're really going to take a deep dive into that section of emergence and extubation, doing it awake. So the real question becomes like, why would we do this over doing, say, a deep extubation? And that's a really good question. So a as, a, as we mentioned earlier and last episode, doing a deep extubation is good for a certain population. So people, again, who are not obese or who don't have sleep apnea, people who are an easy mask ventilation. So after we paralyze or we put you to sleep, how easy is it to mask you, to bag valve mask you? How easy of an intubation are you? Am I able to DL you in one try? Or do I need to hold cricoid pressure? Do I need to take a couple passes to even get a view? Do I need to get the glide scope? So what was the intubation like? And so going into the case, we can kind of 
think about emergence and extubation, but we really don't know if you're a good candidate for a deep extubation until we actually bag valve mask and intubate you and then get a good sense of how easy or how difficult that was. Now, on the flip side of that, also, also for deep extubation, somebody who's not a big aspiration risk, so no GERD uh, and people without full stomachs. So that, that kind of covers the deep extubation criteria. And then on the awake extubation side, that's our alternative is to wake somebody up. And there are clinical scenarios in which that is very good. And that's what we want to do. Uh, I will say this, you probably won't ever be faulted for doing an awake extubation on somebody. Now, if it's somebody like super young and healthy and they have like a 20 minute surgery and is under general anesthesia and everything is completely perfect, somebody may question why you didn't pull it deep, but you would never be faulted for doing an awake extubation uh, because whenever we say an awake extubation, we're talking about when the, and there's several different criteria that that people, there, there's textbook criteria and there's clinical criteria, what you see in real practice versus what you read in the textbook. So, and I'll, we'll go in, to take kind of a deeper dive into that here in a little bit as well. But uh, an awake excavation sounds just like what it is. The patient is awake enough that they are able to control their own airway. So the theory is the aspiration risk is significantly lower or almost zero. If they do start vomiting, they're able to control their airway. And it's, you know, it's not like they have flaccid airway muscles and everything's just going to pile back into the glottis and down the trachea and the patient's going to aspirate. So that's the benefit of doing an awake extubation is the patient is able to maintain their own airway. And if they do vomit, they can control that and they're not going to aspirate. And so that's kind of what the awake part of an awake extubation looks like and the benefits of it. As I said, you're not going to be faulted for really doing an awake extubation on anyone. And the way you, as I said in the last video, the way you emerge and extubate is really going to be culture dependent at your facility. So there's some facilities who may not deep extubate anybody regardless. Everybody gets woken up. And there may be some facilities where you deep extubate everybody and you don't really wake anybody up unless they don't meet those specific criteria. And so, and, and again, the specific criteria for deep extubation is also kind of fluid. It's not just a, a cut and dry it's very much gray, and you will find that out when you get into the clinical setting as well. That's really all I'll say about that. As far as the awake extubation, you're not going to be faulted for waking a patient up to where they can manage their own airway. So that's the preface. That's the uh, start of kind of what an awake extubation is. Now we're going to jump back into our clinical scenario and kind of talk through awake extubation. So our clinical scenario, I believe in episode one was a 40 year old, no past medical history, a laparoscopic cholecystectomy. And so we will kind of take it from there. We'll say that the surgeon is pulling out the gallbladder now. And so after the surgeon pulls the gallbladder out, the trocars are going to come out of the abdomen and they're going to start closing and we're going to be done depending on who's closing probably in about 15 minutes. So we have about 15 minutes to get this patient woken up and ready to go to pack you or our OR nurses are really going to be looking at us kind of dinging their clocks waiting on us to move things along. So, and I will say this, uh, this is kind of a side note, but always do what's best for the patient. This kind of seems com it seems like everyone would know this, but you would be surprised, uh, especially as a nurse anesthesia resident, when you're in the OR, hopefully your CRNAs are with you when you're extubating. And it can be easy for the staff to kind of rush you along and try to push you to do things that may not be in the best interest of the patient. Maybe you need to stay there an extra five or 10 minutes to do whatever you're doing, make sure the patient's stable enough to be transported to pack you. Whatever that is, don't let the time or don't let the pressure for production get in the way of doing what's best for the patient. And sometimes that's hard to do with pushy people in the OR, but just remember that you have a duty to that patient and the duty is to do no harm. And so you need to be very careful and take extreme caution, especially in the period of emergence and extubation, because that's when things can go wrong. Take your time and make sure the patient is stable enough to go. Don't let the production pressure pressure you into doing something that may be unsafe for the patient. So we'll just leave that at that. 
Okay, so the gallbladder's out. We know that the surgeon is about to start closing skin and we're gonna be done here shortly. So there are a few different ways to wake the patient up. I'm gonna talk to you about two of the most common ways. The first way is a nitrous wake up. And the second way is a propofol wake up. So we'll start with a nitrous wake up. And I'll just kind of walk you through what that looks like. And then we can talk more kind of about the technique and, and that sort of thing here in a few minutes. So uh, let's say that again, the gallbladder is coming out. The surgeon's about to be closing here shortly. So at this point in time, after the gallbladder's out, trocars are out of the abdomen. Uh, I would put the patient on 100% FiO2. So we mentioned in our first episode, we tend to run the patients at about 50 to 55% FiO2. Uh, so we would switch the patient to 100% FiO2, so two liters of oxygen. And then we could check our twitches and kind of see where we are with our paralytics. When did we last give rock? Is the patient paralyzed? Um, we'll say that we have two twitches back. And at this point, we'll go ahead and reverse. So our gas is still on. We're still at like, we'll say a MAC of gas. We'll go ahead and reverse with either Sigambidex or Neoglyco. After we're reversed and the appropriate time has elapsed for that, so about 10 minutes for neostigmine glycopyrrolate, maybe two minutes for Sugamidex, we'll check our twitches again, and we'll just say that we're fully reversed. So the gold standard is quantitative uh, train of four monitoring. However, in my clinical rotations, I have never seen a quantitative train of four monitor. I have seen a lot of qualitative train of four monitors. So ensure that the patient is adequately reversed and then the patient's still on the vent, the patient's not breathing right now. And then uh, we'll go ahead and suction the patient out and put in an oral airway or put in a nasal airway. Typically for awake extubations, I put in an oral airway because we really don't want the patient to bite down on the ET tube. Remember in our, in our last episode, we briefly mentioned a laryngospasm, which is where the uh, muscles that control the vocal cords will spasm and, and snap shut. And that can, one of the consequences of that is negative pressure pulmonary edema because the patient is trying to breathe against negative pressure and, or the patient is trying to breathe against a closed glottis that creates a lot of negative pressure inside the thorax. I can pull that fluid into the alveoli and it can be a, a form of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. It can be lethal. And so we really want to avoid that. The same thing can happen if the patient bites down on the ET tube, there's no airflow going and they try to breathe against a bitten ET tube, creates the same effect as the cords being snapped shut in a laryngospasm. They can, they will not be exchanging air and they'll create a bunch of negative pressure in there and cause negative pressure pulmonary edema. So all of that to say, put in an oral airway uh, on the patients that you're fully waking up because they're gonna be chopping at the tube at some point, uh, especially if they're young and healthy, young and relatively healthy, Older people tend to not bite the tube as much. That's just been my clinical experience. And some people just use nasal airways. So uh, my experience, I use an oral airway, especially if I'm waking somebody all the way up. So suction out, oral airway goes in. They're on 100% FiO2. We've reversed already. At this point, I would we're doing a nitrous wake up. I would do, there's a few different ways to do this. You can do 50-50 nitrous and just turn your gas halfway down or you can do 70, 30 nitrous and cut your gas completely off. And this again, kind of depends on the patient, how much anesthetic has the patient required? Um, because 70, 30 nitrous is gonna give you about 0.8 MAC, which is should be adequate for closing skin. Now, obviously if they're in the abdomen, you're not gonna be running nitrous on a laparoscopic case anyway, but if they're in the abdomen and they're still manipulating things, that may not be enough, but there's not a lot of stimulation from just suturing. So 0.8 max should should uh, should be plenty. So I tend to run 70, 30 nitrous on the wake up. So what that looks like is three liters of nitrous, one liter of oxygen, and that's around 21, 22 ish percent FiO2. And so our anesthesia machine has a hard stop, not allowing you to create a hypoxic mixture, meaning you can't just turn on like 10 liters of nitrous and one liter of oxygen. And the patient, you're setting a hypoxic mixture, meaning you're going below what room air, so 21% FiO2. So our machine won't allow us to set the hypoxic mixture. And so we'll turn on three liters of nitrous, one liter of oxygen. That's the most you can run of nitrous, that 70-30 mixture. 
Uh, you can obviously turn the flows up so you can do like 10 liters of nitrous and seven liters of oxygen. However, the principle is still the same. The mixture is still the same. You're just running lower flows. Now, if you want to get that on faster, you can certainly do higher flows. Uh, it it, it kind of depends on how much time you have. But in this case, we'll turn 70-30 on. So three liters of nitrous, one liter of oxygen, turn the gas completely off. So turn our sevofluorine or isofluorine, whatever we're or desfluorine, typically if we're running des, we're not going to wake up on nitrous because it's very fast anyway. So regardless, turn our gas all the way off. And the thing with nitrous is, and this is not a pharmacology lecture. I'm not, certainly not a pharmacologist or anything expert in pharmacology, but I will share the, the small amount of information that I do know from school. And so uh, nitrous uh, will wait, will help us with our wake-ups in a few different ways. So it has some analgesic effects. It's an NMDA, part of its property is an NMDA receptor antagonist. So it's going to give us a little bit of pain control. And then there's something called the second gas effect. And so uh, nitrogen is the most abundant substance in our atmosphere, thus the most abundant substance in our lungs, or the, the most abundant atom, I guess you would say, in our lungs, uh, simply because it outnumbers oxygen. And so nitrous oxide is 34 times more soluble than nitrogen. And so nitrous oxide will replace all of that nitrogen in your alveoli. And it will hasten the onset of our volatile anesthetics. So we can use this at induction. We're obviously talking about emergence and extubation now. Can be used at induction. We do that on pediatric patients uh, or even adult patients. Um, kind of the same clinical effect will happen whenever we're trying to onset the gas and when we're trying to pull the gas off. So nitrous oxide will hasten the onset, meaning it meaning more sevoflurane will get into the alveoli faster with nitrous than just sevoflurane alone. And the opposite of that is true as well. So when we're using nitrous to wake somebody up, putting nitrous in there replaces all of the molecules of sevoflurane and sevoflurane will come off faster out of the alveoli. And so it will, versus just turning the gas off and letting the patient breathe it off, turning nitrous on pulls that sevoflurane off faster and it allows us to turn the gas off sooner. So more gas is getting off and our gases kind of follow that concentration gradient. So there's a lot of concentration of gas in the brain right now because there's a steady flow of it coming in through the alveoli, coming in through the blood up to the brain. And then once that flow is stopped, once we turn the gas off, the reverse is true. That concentration gradient switches because not a lot is coming in now. So more of that gas is going to start coming off. And once more comes off, more is going to follow because the concentration gradient reverses. And so we're replacing all that sevoflurane with nitrous oxide. The gas is coming off. And, and that's kind of the whole point of doing an awake extubation is we are trying to pull off that gas as quick as we can because that's what's keeping the patient asleep under general anesthesia. And so nitrous, as we established earlier, is very soluble, meaning it's very fast on, very fast off. And so whenever um, whenever we're pulling off that sevoflurane, the sevoflurane is what's keeping our patient asleep. And so once all the sevoflurane gets off, the patient's going to wake up and they're going to breathe. And so at this point, we've turned our SIVO off. We have three liters of nitrous going, one liter of oxygen. And now we just essentially wait for all of the gas to blow off. And so we can watch this by our entitled SIVO concentration. We'll see this on our monitor. We can see the Inspire, the FI of SIVO, and we can see the ET or the entitled of SIVOfluorine. And so the MAC value of sevoflurane is around 2%. And so if we're at a MAC, we've got 2% expired sevoflurane. Once we turn that gas off, it's going to wean off pretty fast because as we, as we said just a few minutes ago, nitrous oxide is going to help pull that gas off even faster. And so our goal is to get that gas off as fast as we can. And the nitrous oxide is going to provide enough of a sedative effect that uh, the patient is hopefully not going to wake up or move. Now, with that being said, 
This all kind of depends on the anesthetic requirements of the patient. If you're realizing that the patient's requiring a lot of narcotics, requiring a higher MAC value, requiring maybe 1.1 MAC or something like that to tone their autonomic nervous system down, you may have to work in either more narcotic or more fentanyl, preferably not more narcotic because that is going to be a respiratory depressant. You can start titrating a narcotic whenever the patient's breathing. Uh, and then you can also titrate in some propofol here as well. You can give 10, 20, 30 milligrams just to, if they are trying to buck on the tube or whatever they're doing. Most, I would say like 90% of patients are fine with 70, 30 nitrous. They're not going to be moving around. Now there's that, you know, five or 10% that may do that. And again, titrate in whatever you can to kind of chill that out. Uh, but most patients in my experience aren't going to be bucking around at uh, 70, 30 nitrous. Again, they may, but you just have to kind of take it patient by patient. Well, hello, future CRNA, another daily dose of inspiration along your CRNA journey. This success story from our student starts as follows. I had my first ever interview yesterday afternoon and received a call this morning that I have been accepted into my top choice program. I'm still in shock and so excited. I don't, I didn't think this would ever be possible this year since I hadn't been able to get any interviews of the other two schools I had applied to, but I kept studying and I kept praying. The timing was perfect and it happened exactly how it was supposed to. I'm so grateful for this community, the support and encouragement from everyone. The hard work that Jenny, Richard, and Don have put into this has been life-changing for me. Huge thank you to Haley Frank for a wonderful mock interview back in October. 100% recommend. The five-day interview prep was so helpful as well as all the other resources. I watched all the mock interviews as well. For those that compare yourself to others just like I did, just know that everyone has a different path. I have three years of CVICU experience, a CCRN, CSC, GRE of 302, a cumulative GPA of a 3.2. The last 60 credits though of GPA was a 3.7 and a science GPA of a 3.5. I really believe the interview is what pushed me to the top because I was able to answer questions precisely, show my personality and my clinical knowledge. Keep pushing forward because if you can, if I can do this, so can you. So I love this story because maybe they were having doubts about their overall GPA being closer to 3.2. Um, but what I want to point out here is that they broke down their GPA between what was the last 60 credit hour GPA as well as the science GPA and overall. So know that your GPA is not just one number. It has multiple moving parts to it. So you have to really know them all in order to make better decisions about how to move forward. Um, I also love the fact that, you know, they seemed like they were facing a lot of fear and a lot of doubt whether this was going to be possible for them, but the timing just worked and they never would have experienced the success had they not tried. They applied and they got in. So for those of you who are questioning whether to wait a year, just apply and see what happens. Now, I will also caution you to make sure that you know if your school has an application limit. Um, some schools only allow you to apply once or twice or maybe three times. So make sure you know that prior to just winging it. I'm not saying to just wing it and get one in just to get it in. But I do think if you start the process of trying to apply to CRNA school and getting the feedback on how to move forward if you're not selected is really the quickest way to gain acceptance to CRNA schools. So just start putting yourself out there um, and then take the feedback. So I hope you guys enjoyed this inspirational story. Congratulations. You know who you are. And I'm so excited for you. I'm rooting for you all the way through. Now back to the show. So uh, where we're at now, we've turned our gas off. Our nitrous is on 7030. And at this point, a very important step needs to happen. And that is we need to leave the patient on the ventilator. We can turn them to SIMV. I see some people put on pressure support and to try to get the patient back breathing. And that really just delays the gas coming off because the patient's not breathing. You're not ventilating. You're trying to build CO2. The gas isn't going to come off very fast. So my technique is to leave them on the ventilator just like they were, maybe switch them to SIMV. And then as they're ventilating, that gas is going to blow off faster and faster, which is going to hasten your wake up. Because if they're on pressure support and they're only breathing, you know, three or four times a minute while you're trying to raise their CO2 level, because that's the drive to breathe, not oxygen. If you're trying to raise that CO2 level and you're not ventilating, gas is not going to be coming off. So leave them on the vent, SIMV, and then let the gas blow off because uh, patients will start breathing whenever the gas is off. They'll probably start breathing way before the gas is off, but patients will breathe when the gas is off, given that they are not over-narcotized or anything of that nature. So 
Now we have our vent going and we're not necessarily worried about the patient breathing right now on their own. We're just trying to get the gas off. They're still closing skin. At this point, whenever the sevoflurane gets to like 0 0.3, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, 0 0.5, somewhere in there, then we I switch them over to pressure support and just see where they are. I'll, I'll see at this point, are they even breathing over the vent? They're an SIMV. And if they're not breathing over the vent, I'll switch over to pressure support. Now that I've got the gas down to a manageable level and I'll see what they do. So we can turn our trigger down to one or we can leave it at two, see where the patient's breathing, I'll, you know, start at a pressure support of eight to 10 and see what tidal volumes are pulling. And usually by this point, when I switch to pressure support, they start breathing and they're just going to get better and better with time. And so we'll say our patient is breathing now. She's pulling you know, 300 tidal volumes with a rate of like 12. And again, as we mentioned in our last episode, we can look at the minute ventilation. This is kind of where we're going to titrate in our pain medication. Um, if the patient, if, if we're seeing signs of the patient's in pain. And so we're trying to keep our minute ventilation between three and five liters per minute. Uh, if they're over five, that's a good indication that we probably should do something about it pain medication wise. And there are a few different ways you can handle it. You can do something like Toradol. You can do your ad, really any adjunct pain medication, or you can jump to the narcotics. You can do something fast acting like fentanyl. However, fentanyl is going to be off in about 45 minutes or so. Or you can do something longer acting like Dilaudid or morphine. Or if you're doing some opioid sparing techniques, you can do, you know, if you're doing a block after the procedure, or if you did a block pre-procedure, you can do Tylenol, you can do magnesium. There are just a wide variety of things, ketamine, there are a wide variety of ways you can address that. Um, the most common by far is probably going to be titrating in a narcotic if that minute ventilation is over about five or so. And kind of troubleshooting this area, really determining is the patient, let's say the patient wasn't pulling good tidal volumes. There would be a few different pathways we would have to go down to try to troubleshoot that. And that is, is the patient fully reversed from their muscle relaxant? So kind of go down that pathway, make sure we're, we've got full reversal on board. Uh, is the patient too comfortable? How much narcotic did you give? What what all have we given for pain? Maybe we need to consider reversing some of that just enough to get them breathing. Uh, so those are kind of the pathways you have to work down if they're not pulling good tidal volumes. And so we'll say this patient's pulling great tidal volumes. She's a pressure support of like eight. So we'll drop her down to five and we'll kind of see where we're at with that. And so at really after they've started suturing skin, they're kind of on their last little port site and they're stitching that up uh, and the patient's breathing fine, pulling, you know, three, 400 tidal volumes at a rate of eight to 10. I would cut the nitrous and then turn the flows all the way up. So 15 liters per minute, 20 liters per minute, whatever your flows go to. And then kind of depending on the time, you can let the patient breathe all of, breathe, breathe, essentially breathe the nitrous off. The SIVO is mostly, the vast majority is off. There's still going to be some SIVO coming off, but the vast majority is going to be off. Uh, and then depending on the timing that you have, you can pull your bag off of the anesthesia machine and empty it out because that bag in our anesthesia machine is essentially a rebreathing circuit or rebreathing a lot of the gas that's been in there, pull that bag off, empty the bag, put it back on, and then flush it with our oxygen flush valve while the patient's either on the bag mode, fill it up with fresh oxygen. And then at this point, if the patient's doing good on pressure support, I'd switch them over to spontaneous. So put them on the bag and see where they're at. Again, the tidal volumes are gonna start really small and they get bigger and bigger and bigger uh, with each subsequent breath. And so really for extubation, at this stage, we're going to make sure that the patient can follow commands. That's really the um, point of doing an awake extubation is the patient is awake enough to follow commands and they're in control of their own airway. And so unfortunately, awake extubations tend to be less pretty than deep extubations because the patient will feel the endotracheal tube in their throat. They may do some coughing. They may do some gagging. You can. They may do some bucking. However, typically in a patient that is adequately, in a patient that their pain is adequately controlled, uh, they're not going to do as much bucking or coughing or anything on the endotracheal tube. And um, another thing that we would consider going way back to, in, going back to induction is we can do tracheal lidocaine. And so uh, there's these kits are called LTA kits. And it's essentially 5% lidocaine, 
five mLs with this long tube, uh, and it, it looks like the um, little pop-off caps. They're like the uh, crash cart tubing. You, know, you screw it in. And it's got this long tube. It's probably I don't know, twelve inches long. When you're intubating, you get your view. You can stick that little tube down. Once you get your view, stick it down the trachea and then push the lidocaine. The lidocaine sprays out into the trachea. And this essentially anesthetizes the trachea and all of the nerve endings that are in there that cause that sympathetic stimulation, the bucking and gagging and coughing, all that. So, however, caveat to that is that the lidocaine really only lasts about an hour. So a procedure that's over an hour, hour and a half, maybe two hours tops, it's not really productive to use the tracheal lidocaine because it's going to be worn off by the time you extubate anyway. So the tracheal lidocaine is a good thing to use if the procedure is short enough to tolerate it. And that way, the and I've used, I've done kind of done my own study here, you know, in the patients that I've seen, when I don't use that, there is significantly more bucking and coughing than when I do use that. It definitely makes a difference, again, if the procedure is short enough so that, so that it's not worn off by the time you extubate. So at this point, going back to what we said, um, we have our nitrous completely off, flows all the way up, and the patient's breathing on their own. We're, we're looking for good tidal volumes, and we're essentially waiting for the patient to wake up. And so the criteria that we would use for this is, can the patient follow commands? There's some textbook criteria that we had to learn in school about when the patient is extubatable. Um, and, you know, can they lift their head off the bed for like nine seconds? Can they hold a tongue blade between their teeth? There's all these random criteria that um, we don't really use in the clinical setting. You have to know it for your exams and for boards, but not something that's necessarily used in the clinical setting. But short answer is, can the patient follow commands? If you tap the patient on the forehead, do they open their eyes? Do they respond? Can you say, hey, Mrs. Jones, open your eyes for me. Does the patient open their eyes? Can they squeeze your fingers? Uh, do they, are they, tr are they moving around? Do they have purposeful muscle movements? Are they reaching up to try to pull the endotracheal tube themselves? Uh, if that's the case, if they have these purposeful movements, you'll know that the patient is extubatable and they're in control of their own airway. And so again, make sure the patient is breathing adequately on their own. And one thing you have to look for here is has the patient gone through stage two? So we talked about the stages of anesthesia in our last episode. Uh, stage two being that period of hyperreactivity, meaning when the patient's tachycardic, they're breath holding, they have a disconjugate gaze. It's that period where you're more prone to developing a laryngospasm. And we don't want to extubate in that period, especially in somebody that may be a difficult mask or a difficult intubation. For whatever reason, we're waking the patient up. Um, we will say that we don't want to pull that in stage two because maybe they're a difficult mask and the way to break that laryngospasm is going to be positive pressure and bagging the patient. Or if they're not breathing, bagging them in general. And so we don't want to have to deal with that. So make sure they're not in stage two. Make sure they're not breath holding. Open their eyes. Are their pupils pointed opposite directions? All those things are signs that they're in stage two. Let them wake up a little further. They might be coughing and gagging on the tube. If that's the case, you can give a little bit of propofol to kind of calm that down. You can also bag the patient through this. So if they're breath holding and they're desatting, and you'll see this, especially in obese people, when they're coughing and gagging on the tube and they're not breathing, their FRC is not good to begin with. They're going to desat very fast. So bag the patient bag them through that. And eventually they're going to make it to where there's some purposeful muscle movements. They're reaching up to try to pull the tube out. They're opening their eyes. They're trying to sit up. At that point, have everything ready. Maybe they need one last suction because you remember we suctioned earlier when we put in the oral airway. One last good suction that will also stimulate them to breathe. And then have everything ready, have our mask ready, have our syringe ready to pull the um, air out of the pilot balloon. And we're on 100% FiO2. So at this point, the patient is extubatable. She's lifting her head off the bed, reach up, try to grab the tube herself. We'll pull the air out, disconnect our circuit, pull the tube out. We'll put the circuit on our mask and we'll hold some pressure and do like a little chin lift, jaw thrust, not a chin lift. We'll do a jaw thrust, holding the mask with two hands and waiting, essentially wait for the patient to breathe. Typically, if they are awake enough that they're following commands, they're gonna start breathing immediately. So we'll say our patient's breathing great, uh, and then we will pull our mask off, put a non-rebreather on, and off to pack you we go. So that's kind of what a nitrous wake-up looks like. I will say this, though. We didn't really cover this a few minutes ago, but after we have turned our nitrous off and our turn, when we turned our flows up, we really want to wait until that nitrous is blown off all the way. 
And typically, if you're actually waking the patient all the way up as to where they're opening their eyes and they're about to pull the tube themselves, the gas and the nitrous will almost always be all the way off. Uh, it's very rare that somebody's going to have some nitrous left and they're still trying to open their eyes and pull the tube out. Now, they may make non-purposeful movements. They may be coughing and bucking on the tube with a little bit of gas, a little bit of nitrous left. Just let them breathe that off or breathe for them, again, if they're breath holding or if they're desounding, all of those things. So uh, especially in obese po- in obese people, the sevoflurane or the isoflurane or the desflurane, whatever gas we're using is very soluble in the fat. And so obese people have a lot of reserve as far as fat. And so a lot of sevoflurane just kind of leaches out into that fat and that concentration gradient reverses. And it's just going to take some time for that sevoflurane to get off. And so you may be there. Uh, you probably will be there a lot longer if you're trying to wake somebody all the way up versus if you're doing a deep extubation. And so that's one of the things of the deep extubation is once you get them back breathing, it's pretty easy. Pull the tube and go. Uh, with an awake extubation, it can just be so variable from the time your gas is reading zero or like 0.1 or 0.2 Mac to the time that they're actually awake and ready to go and following commands and, you know, doing all those things that would be the extubation criteria. So you are going to be there a little bit longer if you're doing an awake extubation, a true awake extubation uh, versus if you're doing a deep extubation. So that's kind of what one way of doing an awake, uh, doing an awake extubation looks like. Here's the second way, and that's doing a propofol wake up. And so we'll say, go back to our original scenario, the surgeon's pulling the gallbladder out, after the gallbladder's out, trocars are out, they're about to close the abdomen uh, or the close the port sites, we'll suction our patient out, oral airway in, 100% FiO2, cut the gas completely off, and then we will... Um, I think I said reverse, sorry. If I didn't say reverse, reverse the patient. Make sure they're fully reversed. Check our twitches. And then we'll leave our vent on like we did last time. So the only thing here, everything's the same as our nitrous wake up, except we're not turning on nitrous, just cutting the gas off. And then at this point, turn leave the vent on because we're wanting to get the gas off. And then as the gas is coming off, when we get to about 0.5 Mac, I would give probably 10, 20, 30 maybe 40, 50 milligrams of propofol, depending on the patient. Again, this all depends on how much anesthetic the patient's requiring. Some patients get away with 20 milligrams. Some patients may need 50 milligrams of propofol. But after you're about at 0.5, 0.6 MAC, give a little propofol. uh, And the propofol is essentially working like the nitrous, except the propofol is not pulling off the sevoflurane like the nitrous is. But the propofol is going to keep the patient asleep enough that the gas comes off but they're not bucking and coughing and everything while the surgeon's trying to close the skin. So we're kind of achieving the same purpose here, except except the uh, the propofol is not pulling off sevoflurane. So nitrous, again, will help pull that gas off, which works in our favor. Propofol is just keeping the patient asleep a little longer or just sedated enough that the gas is coming off so they're not going to start waking up. And, and I will say... This is very much an art form. I'm not, I haven't done this as much as I've done the nitrous wake-ups. I do like this wake-up, but, and you can really time the gas really anytime. You can honestly turn the gas off while the abdomen's still inflated. You just need to make sure you're giving propofol to keep the patient asleep. So timing the gas is kind of the key here. Maybe you'll shut your gas off right when they like deflate the abdomen before the gallbladder's out. So you buy yourself a few more minutes. And as you're turning the gas off, you know, we're bumping propofol that 20, 30, 40, 50 milligrams every, you know, five, six minutes, maybe sooner, depending on the patient. This all kind of is very patient dependent. It's not black and white. It's very gray. Uh, And we'll just work in that propofol. Everything else essentially remains the same. We are trying to uh, burn or trying to pull that gas off as fast as we can. And there are a few different ways we can speed that up. We can turn our flows all the way up to like 15 liters per minute, that's going to hasten the onset or that's going to hasten the offset of sevoflurane because we're forcing oxygen in and we're forcing that concentration gradient even further out because we've turned our flows up. Uh, We can take the bag off, empty the bag, put it back on, flush it with the O2 valve. And all the same principles kind of apply as getting the patient breathing again. So once we're at that 0.4, 0.5 MAC, put them on pressure support, see if the patient's breathing. Uh, and depending on how much propofol you've worked in, they probably will be breathing. So 
Uh, and again, the propofol is kind of being titrated to that minute ventilation. So our minute ventilation between about three and five, if your minute ventilation is seven, treat maybe with some fentanyl or morphine or dilaudid, give a little propofol and then titrate that to that minute ventilation of about three to five. And then you'll know, you know, if you, if you're giving 50 milligrams and you take their minute ventilation down to one, you know, that you probably overshot it a little bit, maybe get 30 next time and see once they start breathing here in about five minutes and see uh, what their minute ventilation is kind of titrate it to that. So that's the other way to do an awake extubation. All the same principles apply. Uh, once the gas is off and once the surgeon is essentially done, they're on their last stitch. Don't give any more propofol because the patient just needs to wake up. Profile is going to last, you know, five minutes, maybe depending on how much you gave. Uh, and then just let the patient wake up. We'll, we'll essentially do the exact same thing we're doing on the nitrous wake up. Make sure the patient's following commands. Can they lift their head off the table? Can they open their eyes? Can they squeeze your hand? Are they trying to reach up? Are they making purposeful movements? Then, you know, the patient's extubatable. And again, get them through that breath holding stage, get them through stage two, maybe give a little more propofol for that get them past that stage of the gas coming off and then pull the tube. So have everything ready, deflate our pilot balloon, pull the tube out and put our mask on, do the jaw thrust, make sure the patient's exchanging, uh, put our non-rebreather on and then off to pack you we go. So that's kind of what awake extubations look like. And again, you're not going to be faulted for doing an awake extubation really on anyone, because that's kind of the gold standard is, you know, if the patient's a difficult mask, a difficult tube, if you have any trouble with the patient at all, waking the patient all the way up is never the wrong answer. And again, this is going to kind of be facility dependent on or culture dependent on what, uh, where you work. This is obviously when you, you know, graduate and you pass your board junior CRNA as a nurse anesthesia resident, it may be up to you to determine what your plan for emergence and extubation is, or your preceptor may say, Hey, we're going to deep extubate this patient or we're going to wake extubate. But I will, if you're, you know, a nurse anesthesia resident, I would encourage you to come up with that plan on your own and tell your preceptor, your plan, uh, at the beginning of that case, be like, hey, here's here's my plan. I plan to deep excavate this patient. Uh, here are the reasons why. And I'll let you know for sure as soon as we mask and intubate the patient if that's still a good plan or not. If you have trouble, you know, there, there have been patients that I've had that I'm like, this is a perfect deep excavation patient. And, you know, I mask easy, everything's good. And I go to look and I'm like, see nothing, takes a couple of times with DL, maybe I have to get the glide scope. And I'm like, okay, we're going to abort the deep extubation plan because if all else fails and they're under a MAC of gas, still you pull the tube, the alternative is to intubate the patient again. You may have to re-intubate. So that's why you need to know if the patient's an easy airway or not. So um, again, ne you'll never be faulted for waking a patient all the way up. Um, that's kind of what awake excavations look like. You can do the nitrous wake up or you can do a propofol wake up. The other alternative to that is just turn the gas off. You kind of have to time that right if you're not giving propofol. Because if you turn the gas off while the surgeon's still trying to close and the patient's still bucking and moving around, you're going to hear about it. They're going to want you to do something. So the propofol tends to work well if you're not using nitrous. Uh, I will say out of the two, nitrous is probably my favorite. Nitrous is known to cause postoperative nausea and vomiting. That's really if you're running it for like the entire case over, you know, 45 minutes or so. At the end of the case, if you're running it for 10 minutes to wake somebody up, it doesn't cause postoperative nausea and vomiting. I've actually followed up with my patients on this and they, they aren't nauseated and vomiting from the nitrous. So if somebody has a significant history of that, maybe I would forego that. But you know, in, in, in a patient who doesn't have a significant history of PONV, I wouldn't really worry about it, uh, honestly, because I, I haven't seen it much, especially with just a wake up. Um, so that's kind of how you do. Well, that's how that's how I do the awake extubations, nitrous probably being my top one, propofol in a close second, and then turning the gas off. Uh, again, you have to time that correctly. I'm not that good. I can't time it perfectly all the time. Um, but that's another option. Just cut the gas off and don't do anything else uh, and let the gas blow off itself. So that's that's uh, a good overview of doing uh, awake extubations. If you have comments, comment below. I'd love to hear your comments on this, especially if you're a CRNA or nurse anesthesia resident. I'd love to hear your thoughts about doing awake extubations either with nitrous or without nitrous or with propofol uh, or just turning the gas off, you know, and, and winging it. So 
Uh, comment below if you have questions. And thank you so much for listening. And I will see you next time. Hey, Future CRNA. As always, I appreciate you and your loyalty. Thank you so very much for tuning in this week. I'd love to hear from you, so screenshot this episode and share it to your IG stories with your biggest takeaway. Don't forget to tag me at Sierra School Prep Academy so I can personally thank you. Be sure to head over to SierraNSchoolPrepAcademy.com to check out our blog and gather free resources to help you along your Sierra journey. Stay strong, and I'll see you next week.